Here I am in Birkenau, the closest place to hell on this earth. here entrance to the camp where all the trains came in and I cannot believe that so many millions have crossed seas and the world has done nothing about it and I'm trying to think as I'm walking with what happened here what exactly happened here Oh God. And I see them taking mother in that direction. And she had her arms stretched out of it. Where did she vanish? Where did she vanish? Where to? Mom. I will tell our story. I will tell our story because the world must know. On September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland. The attack unleashed a storm that had been gathering for two decades. Germany's defeat in World War I had left the country humiliated, its economy shattered, providing an opportunity for a radical nationalist movement led by Adolf Hitler. Hitler's rhetoric blamed those who had supposedly weakened the nation. Most of all, he blamed the Jews. He was determined to expel every Jew in Germany and eventually beyond, as the Nazis expanded into Austria, Czechoslovakia, and elsewhere. When the occupation of Poland brought two million Jews under Nazi control, the notion of expulsion increasingly gave way to murder. Even in the most remote villages of Europe, no Jew was safe. I was born in 1934 in Transylvania, Romania, in a tiny village called Ports. We were the only Jewish family in the village, and in the Moses family, there were six people, my father, Alexander, my mother, Jaffa, my older sister, Edith, my middle sister, Alice, and Miriam and I were twins, very cute. And the nice thing about being a twin, we always had each other, so we never felt lonely. We lived on a big, old-fashioned farm. It had a big orchard with lots of fruit trees. I always remember being on the cherry tree, eating some juicy cherries, looking at the sky. And in 1940, I was six years old. And the Hungarians occupied our village, and everything changed. When Hungary allied with Germany, a nightmare began for Jews in the country and its occupied territory. Eva recalls the first film she and Miriam saw, which depicted how to catch and kill a Jew. Their school days became torture. The kids started calling us names, Miriam and me, and dirty Jews. And then they began spitting on us, taunting us and beating us over the face. The teacher did nothing. In Dachau, near Munich, the first Nazi concentration camp was opened less than two months after Hitler became German chancellor. As anti-Semitic policies intensified, the number of camps grew into the thousands. Increasingly, they were used to detain Jews. With the so-called final solution, the Nazis' 1941 decision to annihilate the Jews of Europe, a number of internment camps became killing centers. Most of the murders were done by gassing. The corpses were buried in mass graves or burned in crematoria. Auschwitz first opened in 1940, but soon proved too small. 
So two years later, construction began on a new camp just over two kilometers away. It would become the largest mass murder site in human history. It was known as Auschwitz II, or Birkenau. They came with horses and they said, we have come to take you away. The streets were lined with people. Nobody smiled, nobody said a word. Between May and July 1944, more than 430,000 Hungarian Jews, half of the pre-war population, arrived at Birkenau by cattle car. Railway tracks led directly into the camp to deliver the prisoners within 100 meters of the main gas chambers. The Moses family was among the first to step down onto the freshly hardened concrete of the unloading and selection platform. A Nazi was running in the middle of the selection platform, very clearly yelling in German, twins, twins. He noticed Miriam and me, and he demanded to know if we were twins, and my mother said yes. At that moment, another Nazi appeared from nowhere, pulled my mother to the right, and I can see oh, still as my mother's arms were stretching out toward us, and she was pulled away. There was so much pain in her eyes. That is the last image that I have of my mother. Most underwent a different selection. Nearly 90% were immediately marched to the gas chambers. Men and women deemed stronger were sent in the opposite direction to a world of starvation and brutal labor until they died or were murdered. To the right to live, to the left to die. In the Nazis' attempt to propagate a perfect Aryan race, another group was subjected to medical experiments. Of greatest interest were sets of twins. They were set aside in special barracks, separated by gender, and tattooed with a number on their arms. Eva and Miriam Moses became numbers A7063 and A7064. In the morning, they were awakened by a visit from the so-called Angel of Death, Dr. Josef Mengele. One of the supervisors would be on guard and start, Mangala is coming! Everybody straightened out like little soldiers. He was at the cutting edge, as he thought of it, as Nazi eugenics and race science. He would establish by working on human beings in Auschwitz, on those twins, not only maybe unlock the secrets of twin births so that after the war, every good German mother could have two German children instead of just one, but unlock the secrets of how to engineer a race that looked more like the master race. And that ambition overrode all conscience and sense of morality. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we would march about a mile and a half to Auschwitz I, where we would be placed in a room naked for about eight hours. They would measure every part of my body, compare it to my twin sister, and compare it to charts. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we would be taken to another lab that I call the blood lab. You could have about 30 kids in here at a time. They had chairs with little arms like that, and we put our arms out. And they tied this arm, and they tied this arm, and then they took lots of blood from here and lots of injections into here. The content of those injections, we didn't know then, nor do I know them today. After one injection, Eva became feverish and was taken to the hospital. Mengele determined she had only two weeks to live, but Eva defied him. After a little more than a month, she was back in the barracks, and life as she knew it resumed. Experiments, starvation, stealing food, surviving in a landscape of death. At times, that seemed to be going on so long. And then, suddenly, it came to an end. By January 1945, it was clear the Nazis were on the brink of defeat, and most of the Auschwitz prisoners had been forced marched to other camps. Eva and Miriam were among those left behind. 
On January 27th, the Russians came. There were lots of people. They were all wrapped in white camouflage raincoat. I had no idea who they were, but that was not important. One thing was important. They didn't look like the Nazis, and that had to be good. The Russians were stunned by what they found. Around 7,000 survivors, most nearly frozen, feeble, barely able to move. Dead bodies littered the ground. There were 180 children among the freed prisoners at Auschwitz, and they were now expected to overcome the Auschwitz nightmare. The joy of liberation was tempered by the terrible uncertainty of what had happened to their families, but a flicker of hope remained. I wanted to see my home. It was such a must. I could not go on anywhere without seeing my home again. The journey home took nine arduous months. Finally, a year and a half after being taken from their home, they were back in ports. So now we are finally heading home, running down the hill, hoping that somebody would be home or something good would happen there. We entered. Nobody returned. Disappointment. Disappointment and, and, and sadness. And, uh, you know, that's got to be for an 11-year-old just terribly traumatic, and how do you deal with that? Where do I go? What do we do? The home that I dreamed about was only was the walls. Nobody who was supposed to be there was there. The twins were taken in by their aunt Irena in a neighboring city where they lived for five years under communist rule. Irena had also suffered devastating loss. Her husband and son were murdered in the Holocaust. In all, 1.1 million people were murdered in Auschwitz, one million of them Jews. 3,000 twins were subjected to experiments. An estimated 200 survived. In 1950, two of those survivors, Eva and Miriam Moses, now 16, embarked for Israel to start a new life. We were 3,000 people on a ship sailing the Mediterranean Sea, and we arrived June 19th, arrived finally in the port of Haifa. It was early morning. The sun was rising above the Mount Carmel, and 3,000 people stood up and sang the Hebrew national anthem. 10 years later, Eva Moses was to arrive on yet another shore as a newlywed, but still haunted by Auschwitz. Always Auschwitz. Memorial Pledge. We candles are the voices of the children saved from the ashes. We will not let the world forget what happened here in Auschwitz. We will show our children where their grandparents hugged us for the very last time. We will not rest until Dr. Mengele is caught and brought to justice. During her decade in Israel, Eva attended an agricultural school and served in the army. Then she met an American tourist. They had something in common. Michael Mickey Kor, a Jew from Latvia, had been imprisoned in Buchenwald and other camps for nearly four years. He was liberated by a U.S. soldier from Terre Haute, Indiana, and eventually moved there after he learned that his parents had been murdered. He graduated from Purdue University, became a U.S. soldier and a pharmacist. While visiting Israel, his life took another turn. It was a beautiful dream of a love affair. You have a violin playing behind you. 
and Autumn Leaves playing on the piano. The early years in Indiana seemed idyllic. A son was born and then a daughter. Baseball games, birthday parties, bike riding with picnic lunches. Under the surface, however, a storm was raging, a storm Eva would only begin to understand decades later. It was pain, a lot of pain, and a lot of anger. From the start, Eva felt isolated in Indiana. A young woman separated from her twin for the first time, struggling with the language, often on her own, in a new world with two young kids, a husband working double shifts, and neighbors who couldn't relate to her. She was made fun of, you know, nobody respected her, and I think she didn't feel a sense of purpose and a sense of value. But then, three decades after the war, a four-part miniseries in 1978 called Holocaust marked the first time the subject entered the mainstream public consciousness. There's a cruel and ironic joke about the docudrama The Holocaust. It had more impact than the original. Its impact catapulted the Holocaust to the attention of not only the American people, but also of the world. Oh. Eva Kaur among them. She called the Terre Haute NBC affiliate to see if the show would contain archival material. They said it wouldn't, but asked her for an interview. She appeared on TV twice while the series was being broadcast and attracted a lot of attention. It was transformative. Schools called, asking Eva to tell her story. She did, and encountered questions about the Mengele experiments that she couldn't answer. Searching for answers would become a lifelong mission. She was reclaiming her life. Once she woke up and was like, oh my God, there was a lot that happened to me. From that point forward, then she began to really grow, really grow. Eva was determined to discover what had been done to her and Miriam, what they had been injected with, especially Miriam. After she had experienced difficulties in her pregnancies, her doctors discovered her kidneys had stopped growing when she was 10, in other words, while she was in Auschwitz. For Eva, the first step in the hunt was clear, find other surviving twins. It was very, very important, life-savingly important. In 1983, she attended the first major National Holocaust Memorial event in Washington, D.C., carrying a sign identifying herself as a twin tortured by Mengele. She left disheartened that hardly anyone had heard of the Mengele experiments and that amid all the ceremony, very few actual survivors were asked to speak. She reached out to major newspapers, magazines, and television networks in the United States, imploring them to help her find other Mengele twins. No one replied. And guess what? Nobody cared. Then one day, she had an epiphany. If she were to start an organization and name herself president, the media would be more likely to listen to her. That was the birth of Candles, children of Auschwitz Nazi deadly lab experiments survivors. Around the same time, she persuaded her brother-in-law in Israel to put an advertisement in a major newspaper, seeking other surviving twins there. After all that effort, she began to make progress. Eighty twins in Israel came forward almost immediately. And then finally, she was contacted by a journalist. We got so many letters which we ignored, but there was a quality about Eva's note that totally grabbed me. And I picked up the phone and I called this woman who I think she was a real estate agent in Terre Haute, Indiana. And there began this extraordinary journey, uh, hers and mine, into this long ago world, which everybody had kind of swept aside. The call set off a series of events that would shed new light on the Holocaust and have repercussions on Eva Kaur's life. As Lucette Lagnado worked on her comprehensive story on the Mengele twins, Eva had an idea. On the 40th anniversary of their liberation, have twins return to the scene of the crime, make the world see them, 
hear them, it worked. When the twins arrived in Birkenau on January 27, 1985, and when they followed up the visit with a mock trial of Mengele in Yad Vashem, Israel, the press was there. This weekend is the anniversary of the end of a nightmare, the end of a death camp called Auschwitz, the end of the unspeakable horrors committed by its chief medical officer, a Nazi named Joseph Mengele. The worldwide search for this war criminal was given new impetus today by those who were his victims. That's put it on the radar for the mainstream media in a way that you couldn't have expected it. Joseph Mengele is front and center, and Ava and the twins are responsible for having sparked that fire. The day the mock trial ended, the United States Attorney General, William French Smith, ordered the Justice Department to find Mengele. It became one of the biggest international manhunts in history. Israel and West Germany joined in, and rewards of several million dollars were offered. It was revealed with great fanfare that Josef Mengele's body had been found in a grave near Sao Paulo, Brazil. A preliminary report stated that Mengele had drowned six years earlier in 1979 while swimming off a nearby beach and that his skeleton had been authenticated, quote, within a reasonable scientific certainty, end quote. But the woman who helped initiate the hunt remained skeptical. Eva took to the airwaves. What is your reaction to the reports that Dr. Mengele is dead? Uh, I do not believe it because it just doesn't make sense. She took out a second mortgage on her home to finance an $18,000 inquest on Mangala in Terre Haute. None of it made a ripple. Though the Mangala findings were clearly labeled preliminary, the public had moved on. Case closed. And most of my battles were alone. Nobody understood it. Maybe even today nobody understands it. But I couldn't give up. I can't ever give up on the truth. In 1987, Eva Moses Kor was at rock bottom. She had few friends, a cause no one seemed to care about, and was treated with scorn by the nation's biggest Holocaust organizations. In the fall of that year, Eva flew to Israel to donate a kidney to her ailing sister. As Miriam's condition continued to deteriorate, the fight to find Mengele, or at least his files, took on an air of desperation. How fast do we forget? Where is the press? Four years ago, we were in this building. The world seemed to show us that they cared. So fast, they don't care anymore about a major Nazi criminal that is running loose. The final report, conclusively stating the body was Mengele's, was not published until 1992, seven and a half years after the investigation began. It included several key pieces of evidence not used in the initial report and was apparently clinched by a DNA match between the body and Mengele's son, Rolf. It was a conclusion that Eva continued to disagree with, questioning whether the correct DNA was used. If they took the blood themselves from him and it was used in a DNA match, they might say afterwards, well, how do we know it was done correctly once it was sent off? There's always a reason to still have that doubt. By burying him, putting him six feet into the ground, by putting away that ghost of Mengele, they've put away so many years of this quest of finally standing there in front of him and saying, I'm the 10-year-old girl. Remember me and my sister, Miriam? We were 10 when you first took us. Guess what? You're this old man sitting in front of me, finally brought down, and I'm a woman standing here to tell you that I've survived and, uh, and you failed. In 1993, Miriam Moses died of cancer related to her kidney problems. She was 59 years old. Because of the Jewish practice of burying the body within 24 hours, Eva was unable to attend the funeral. Miriam, the day I got the message from Kuti, your husband, that you left this world, 
I was not prepared to live in a world without you. Again, there was Auschwitz. All that she'd experienced over the years, the isolation, harassment, rebirth, anger, accomplishment and rejection, always led her back to Auschwitz. Now it had taken yet another toll. In every way, it came back to Auschwitz. Moses Kaur, a twin who survived as a child Joseph Mengele's experiment at Auschwitz 50 years ago, hereby give amnesty to all Nazis who participated directly or indirectly in the murder of my family and millions of others. I, Eva Moses Kaur, in my name only, give this amnesty because it's time to go on. It was a decision of a lifetime, which on the surface came about almost by chance. Shortly after Miriam's death, Eva was invited to a conference about medical ethics, accompanied by a peculiar request. Could she bring along a Nazi doctor? I said, where on earth can I find one of those guys? <laughs> Last time I looked in the telephone book, they were not advertising there. <laughs> A couple of years earlier, Eva had taken part in a German documentary that included a Nazi doctor called Hans Münch. Eva got in touch with him, and Münch agreed to be interviewed at his home in Bavaria. I was very scared. Eva had her own agenda and was disappointed when Münch said he had never worked with Mengele and had no idea where his files were. However, Münch had more to say. Did you see the gassing? Sure. I, I, it's, it's, it's my problem. Munch agreed to document what he witnessed and go to Auschwitz with Eva to present it in person. For months, Eva considered how to thank him. Then it hit her, forgiveness. She would forgive Dr. Munch for his crimes as a Nazi. She wrote him a letter and had it edited by her speech professor. I remember in particular um, saying, okay, so Munch, but what about Mengele? Uh, what about all the other SS? You know, are, are you just going to forgive Munch because he's there? You for, your problem is not with Dr. Munch. Your problem is with Dr. Mengele. I went home, closed the door, picked up a dictionary, made a list of 20 nasty words, <laughs> which I read clear and loud to that make-believe Mengele in my room. And then I said, in spite of all that, I forgive you. For her, that was the thing she needed to do. Something was stuck. And whatever that was, I did not sense that in her anymore after she went through that act of forgiveness. I said, you're going to do what? You're going to do what? And so, on the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, on January 27, 1995, Eva Moses Kaur returned once again, this time armed not with anger, but peace. No more wars. No more gas chambers. No more bombs. No more hatred. No more killing. And no more Auschwitz. But Eva's moment of personal liberation was not to everyone's liking. How could she forgive someone that tortured her personally and tortured her sister? And her sister died because of it. I'll never understand. Six million people died. How could she forgive? Enough is enough. Of all the bold acts of Eva Kaur's life, I am healed inside. It was this forgiveness that formed her legacy and that is still debated today. Do I deserve to live free of what Mengele did to me? And I declare with every ounce of my being that I do. 
Most of all, Eva's choice to forgive is about self-healing and self-empowerment, shedding the emotional and psychological burden of what happened to her, and with that, the Nazis' control over her. This way, she says, she was free to resume her life without anger or pain. Anger is a seed for war. Forgiveness, a seed for peace. Eva always made clear that it wasn't about forgetting. On the contrary, she fought to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive so it would never be repeated. This forgiveness had nothing to do with religion. It was not for the perpetrator, nor for anyone else. It is only for herself. Yet some questioned whether such a self-oriented undertaking, even if therapeutic, could be considered true forgiveness. Others said that, especially in Judaism, forgiveness had to be earned, and the Nazis had done nothing to that end. Look, I'm operating out of a deeply and profoundly Jewish religious ethic. Christianity, in some of its interpretations, has an easier view of uh, forgiveness because if Christ died for our sins, then it's not that we have not sinned, but we are forgiven and grace is available to us through Christ. Uh, we Jews are a little bit more tenacious about it. Eva's son says he has issues with his mother's decision to forgive, and yet he's witnessed its effects on his mother and on others. The big criticism is why does she have to be so public with her forgiveness? And I do agree that I think it's very selfish of my mother to do this. On the other hand, she's touched so many more lives than she would have if she would have kept it to herself. Amid all the objection and debate, Eva Moses Kaur continued her mission. Three months after forgiving the Nazis, Eva opened the Candles Museum in a small strip mall in Terre Haute. It remains the only museum in the world specifically commemorating the twins in the Mangala experiments and advocating forgiveness. The museum is dedicated to Miriam. We are a small museum, a small place with a big message. The message is, let's remove hatred and prejudice from our world. Let it begin with me. Tonight, it's a company we all know. Two years after opening her museum, Eva Kaur filed a lawsuit against the German pharmaceutical buyer, claiming it tested its drugs on concentration camp inmates. The claim, along with others against further German companies, helped lead to a $5 billion settlement established by Germany that distributed money to thousands of victims. They have benefited. They should pay restitution. She also released her first book. She oversaw community projects. She pushed to get the Holocaust on the curriculum of Indiana public schools. She became an active force protesting genocide of all kinds. She spoke out about racial prejudice. And as each year brought more people to her museum, the teacher learned something herself, that from her new position, she had the power to make lives better. I know it's some kind of idealistic idea that I could was my little idea of forgiveness. I could somehow help heal the world. But if I help heal one single person, I'm already happy. The other request that I have to you, if somebody doesn't quite fit in, help them fit in, accept them for who they are. You might help somebody who desperately needs it. Forgive your worst enemy. It will heal your soul, and it will set you free. Dylan Parent and Katrina Wimsat were both victims of horrendous violent assault. They say that without Eva, they wouldn't be alive today. Eva gave me forgiveness as an option, as a path that I could take as a method of healing. And it was something that I thought was completely out of my power and out of my control and completely un unattainable. And then she said, forgive, not for them, but for you. And it made 
all the difference. Just forgiving, like all this weight on my shoulders just went away. And she did that for me. And it's the biggest thing that anyone's ever done. Not even a tragic setback could weaken her determination. A little piece of history is lost tonight. On November 18th, 2003, the Candles Museum was destroyed by arson. So much work and so much love and so much care. It kicked off a movement. The reconstruction of Eva's museum put her back in the national spotlight. But this time, the public was far more sympathetic. Eva Cole, who survived the Holocaust and the destruction of her Candles Museum in Terre Haute, has vowed to rebuild. Her sacrifice and that of her husband, Michael, ensures that those who may be exposed to hate, intolerance, and bigotry will also be exposed to love, charity, and mutual respect. Ava and Michael, thank you for being with us. Even some of those who remained adamantly opposed to forgiving the Nazis began to respect the force for good Eva was becoming. Please stand up and welcome Eva Ford. What's Eva accomplished? She's increased consciousness of the Holocaust. She used it as a vehicle to combat racism and prejudice, to argue for human rights and human decency to educate a younger generation. She's built an institution that looks like it's going to take off. What a magnificent contribution to life. Over time, things began to change. The state of Indiana, which hadn't been particularly welcoming to the lonely and struggling immigrant, was proudly proclaiming her as one of its own. A Jewish community in which she'd long been an outcast began seeing her in a new light and Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation memorialized her with an interactive hologram. Do you think another Holocaust is possible? I believe, unfortunately. And somewhere along the line, this woman, who had felt so alone, found something new. She knows she's not alone now. She knows she has all of us. She knows she has thousands and thousands of people who appreciate the struggle she's been through and what she does for them and others. In 2017, at age 83, Eva Moses' core seemed unstoppable. A video interview with BuzzFeed got more than 185 million views. Speeches once in front of dozens were now in front of thousands. Yet at heart, Eva remained the small-town woman she'd been for nearly 60 years. The Core family had been through a lot. Like Mickey, their daughter Rena doesn't like to talk about the Holocaust, but they've stuck together through it all, and Eva's thrice-weekly lectures at her museum remain a must. I see it every day in her. Doesn't matter what she's going through. She needs this museum. She needs to be here. She needs to do what she does. Yet once again, as always, there was Auschwitz. She returned every year, leading tours, no longer to protest, but to pay respect, to teach, to not let the world forget. But the pain remained. If I let myself feel I remember how it was in the belt. And it was not fun. But things changed. In her later years, it was at Auschwitz that Eva Moses' core felt most alive. When I come back here, I don't come back as a victim. I come back as a victorious survivor. We are free! Hope. That's what she offers. And that's what the world needs. That's kind of the, the beauty of, of Eva. 
we, we are really trying to teach the world. We celebrate the fact that, you know, a survivor gets given an award. I know Eva's been given an award. Wonderful. And so she should. What we haven't actually done is turned around and said to people like Eva, thank you. Thank you in spite of the fact that you've had everything taken from you, everything destroyed, that you've had no hope of justice whatsoever personally, that you have pursued the truth relentlessly. And what's more, you then go on to say, I want you to learn to forgive one another because that will lead to greater kindness in our world. We should be saying thank you. Never mind, she has no right to forgive or what, just thank you for the struggle. I would just say, good work. Good work, Eva. You are succeeding. I would say, Mom, um, I'm very proud of you. You may think that uh, you are not uh, a good mother. I, 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 I beg to differ. She rose and she lives and she inspires and she loves and she's mighty and she is this force in so many people's lives. She lives. She lives. Mom, I told our story. You are the guiding light in my life. I sometimes ask myself, would you be proud of me? I hope so. I hope that my message that comes directly from you is what maybe teach the world to heal.